Education. It's been revolutionized before, right? Motion picture, radio, television, computers, video discs, smart boards, smartphones, tablets, now AI tutors. But education still looks the same and learning still happens in the student's head. However, James Gibson challenged that idea. He challenged foundational assumptions educators use to teach every day, but to get there requires a bit of explanation. Rolling back the clock a few years, Descartes was looking at existence. Can we assume our perception of the world matches the real world? We sense the world, but can we trust our senses to be accurate? Descartes' famous saying, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, shows his thinking didn't make him exist, but he could be sure his doubt was coming from somewhere. We know far more than Descartes now about senses, but we are still at the same place. The logic, realism, we exist, as opposed to solipsism, we don't. But that is an assumption, we can't prove it, but we believe it without proof. And assumptions can be held for a long time without challenge, which is what Gibson and others did. They challenged long-held assumptions about perception. If we assume the world exists, how do we gain knowledge? Epistemology is the study of knowledge with lots of theories. Most agree knowledge come from experience with two principles. We begin with no knowledge, tabula rasa, and knowledge is gained from sensory experiences. But we have no meaningful way to know if our senses resemble the real world, so we assume the senses somehow inform us about the world. The somehow is where the fun begins. Broadly speaking, science tests hypothesis for causes. Thing A can cause thing B if A is in direct contact with thing B, local causality. But we can see food, and that could cause us to move, which means that local causality can't be accurate. There is an action at a distance problem. So traditional views of visual perception add something in between, a copy of the world between us and an object. But how does the copy get into our head? Light. It goes from a source to our eyes, creating a retinal image, but we don't experience an upside down 2D back to front image. We need to fix it, potentially using cues, rules, and unconscious inference. Probability. So we use our sight to make a copy of the world, fix the copy, extract cues, apply rules, and compute likelihoods to create mental representations of the world. And apparently, that is done by the central executive. Unfortunately, there are a few problems. If the central executive is in our brain, how does it know the information is coming from out there in the world and not our body? The outness problem. If we have assumed our senses are bad and need fixing, how does the central executive get accurate information to fix what is sensed? The source trust problem. Then, to use cues and rules, we need to make comparisons to past experience. But where did they come from if we start with no knowledge? Most suggestions fall back to probability, using a tally of sorts to figure out what is most likely. But how do you know what's likely if you don't already know what's likely? Robots work like this, but they were programmed to start with prior knowledge. Are we all programmed? I personally don't think so. Popular traditional views hold eight assumptions. We exist, I think a safe and useful assumption. We are born with no knowledge, gaining all knowledge through senses. Gaining knowledge through experience or empiricism seems a safe assumption. But starting with no knowledge, tabula rasa, is questionable. How can we start with no knowledge and need information from prior experience at the same time? 
In visual perception, if the first copy was made with no information, then we don't need prior experience. If the first copy was made with information, then we started with knowledge. Both can't be true. An alternative view, the ecological approach, suggests, quote, knowledge is gained from experience, but experience begins before birth and is shaped by the constraints of the niche and the organism. Referring to the environmental niche and organism meaning not just human focused. The assumption senses somehow inform us about the world is okay, but there is another assumption within that. The assumption senses are passive. We get informed, then act. But we don't aimlessly wander, we go looking, we behave with a purpose. So instead of our senses informing us about the world, organisms use their perceptual systems to inform themselves about the world. It is an active process we organisms go through. Now to the exciting assumptions. Local and linear causality. Traditional views of visual perception add a copy to keep this assumption. But there could be multiple causes, some of them being distant, maybe past experiences and even future possibilities. Motivation as an example cause from the future. So the ecological approach, the approach built on Gibson's work, rejects this assumption. Instead of thinking of causality as a singular, unbroken line, we conceive of events as emergent from the interactions among an entire system. Finding an exact cause or complete set of causes is hard, if not impossible, which puts into question the need for a copy at all. If things are multi-causal and non-linear, instead of indirectly perceiving, using a copy to create mental representations, Gibson suggests direct perception. Other assumptions, like contact with the world is mediated by a copy, rejected. The copy delivered to the brain is bad and needs to be fixed, rejected. Unconscious inference is used to fix the bad copy, rejected. Once the copy is fixed, that is our mental representation of the world, rejected. Because with direct perception, we don't need a copy. So how do we perceive the world? As embodied organisms, things with arms, legs, bodies, not just sense organs, and embedded organisms, we exist in environments, not a void of nothingness, explaining perception should use the organism and environment relationship. Gibson suggested instead of looking for distance, height, and angle, we look for affordances. Changing the questions, instead of how long is the field, is the field walkable? Instead of what is the width of the apple, is the apple graspable? Looking for relational properties, how does the size of the chair relate to you? Is it sit on a ball? Instead of hearing sound, we hear the layout of surfaces. Instead of feeling pressure on the skin, we feel the usability of a tool. Even going as far to say, we can't see light. Sounds wrong, but the argument is that we see illuminated surfaces. Quote, just because the rods and cones are stimulated by light does not mean that what the organism attends to is the light as such. Perception going beyond cell activation levels. This leads to a radically different set of assumptions, impacting cognitive science, all areas of psychology, and practically speaking, education. Thinking back to that pesky central executive, although you may not have heard the term before, you have likely referred to an internal self, the separation or dualism of mind and body. As there is no central executive in the ecological approach, ideas of mind and body are rejected. We as organisms perceive and act in environments exposing information we can use. What in the world has all this got to do with education? Well, we learn from experiences, empiricism, and practice things we want to develop. How and why learners act during practice is therefore important for the learning experiences. Educators, like teachers and coaches, have a philosophy of practice. Write what I've put on the board 100 times because then you will get it in your head. An example where the practice, 
task is built by a philosophy. Some will agree with the philosophy, some won't. Effectiveness is what science tries to measure, but learning happens in the organism-environment relationship. While you write that thing on the board, you remember what to write. When you go away, the relationship fades, thus making it harder to remember. Effective education or effective learning is what educators are looking for. Representative practice is what the ecological approach would encourage, trying to maintain that organism-environment relationship as much as possible, adding constraints to reduce affordances, adjusting the practice complexity to help learning experiences, which some coaches, teachers and policymakers are already doing. Whether they know, agree with or understand the philosophy behind it, project-based learning, work experience, learning on the job. So this philosophical approach applied in formal school would radically change every lesson. It is being and has been pushed by many before, but not necessarily using this approach to explain their reasoning. This was an introduction video to the ecological approach. There was a lot of jargon and complexity added, but hopefully this starts and continues the conversation about an alternative approach to philosophy, psychology, sociology, and other related social sciences that directly impact learning experiences, whether that's in school or outside of school. So if you're interested in contributing to this conversation or future conversations, consider joining the Discord. There is a link in the description below.